Welcome to ThoughtWorks. This is the new edition of uh, ThoughtWorks Talks Tech. I'm Karim Mohammed. I'm uh, a QA, and I have. Uh, My name is Anjali. I'm a developer at ThoughtWorks for two and a half years. Okay, so before we go into the actual session, I would like to ask you all a question. Um, since we are all in the software industry, what do you think? is the top three answers that developers give when you find a bug in their code. <laughs> yeah, that's one. Can we get another one? Something really, really famous. You could even uh, get that one. Sorry? Yeah, that's another one. Someone else gets the point. And that's the feature. <laughs> uh, that too. But another one that really comes to the top of my mind is, have you tried restarting? <laughs> yeah. So yes, yeah, so we want to prevent all of those happening, right? So we, we've faced these issues. We, we really know we've been working with uh, a lot of developers, QAs, BAs for so long. And uh, we all face issues. We just want to get better. It's not that we are perfect, but uh, we want to see how we can do that. And one approach, or the best approach to do that, is to shift quality to the left. Yeah. So testing. Everyone here knows what testing means. It just doesn't mean that the developer does something and then passes it over, and then, hey, that's yours. You got to do what you do. But no, testing actually means we verify functionality of the application, we catch bugs, and also not just catch bugs, but prevent them from coming back. And also, we sometimes use the test cases as documentation. Yeah? So we look at uh, the test cases that are covered, and then we kind of relate that to the documentation. Okay? That's just a few reasons. But what about, you know, we get this a lot from the managers. How do we make sure we have full test coverage? How many of you guys have this question being asked? Asked, you know, we get that a lot. Can we be confident of all test cases are covered? And how can we prevent bugs from happening? So these are a lot <coughs> of questions that we face. And we'll see how we can deal with this. TDD. I am quite sure that everyone has heard the word TDD. Right? What does it really mean? Test-driven development. That's, that's not something new. Everyone has heard it. But really, what is it? Can someone tell me what TDD is? Does anyone really follow TDD? Yes? Basically, it is uh, uh, like the Understanding the requirement, mm -hmm. making the test cases before we develop any code. So it should mm -hmm. have like you know the predictability and the certainty of my function that will work uh, before in hand. Basically, it should 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 return one plus one two. So this is my test case. So it should <coughs> yes, yes, we are quite there. So yes, like you mentioned, so you write test before code write the minimum amount of code necessary to make the test pass. So we don't write all the tests. We just write, we just, write just that teeny bit so that we get the test written first and then write the code so that it passes. And so, we. Uh, my understanding it is the continuous process. Like yes. You have to delete it and run and write it. Itself. Correct. So it's, it's a continuous increment of writing tests and then you enhance your development and go on and on. Yeah. So, comes to the next point: rinse and repeat. Test first. If you really share this idea to, um, would say, I mean, someone who's never practiced TDD before, they would ask, "Why would you test first? How would you know what you're going to test?" You know. <coughs> and then. We will come back to the previous questions that we asked, right? 
you remember code coverage or test coverage and scenarios covered and bug prevention yeah so these are the things that we want to accomplish by TDD so if you write test code if you write tests before you write your code you ensure that all your code are covered by tests because it gives you one it gives you high test coverage and also because you write your tests before you write your code you definitely can ensure all your code is covered yeah <coughs> so we've accomplished that how about the scenarios covered the test cases that you get from the requirements they will reflect exactly what the code does because you write your code you write I mean you write your test then you write your code so it reflects exactly that so you have a visibility of list of functions that you are developing <coughs> and then it also makes it very easy to see which cases are missing we'll say you have a story and then you have da 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 acceptance criteria and then if you start writing your test first and then your code you could easily see which cases are missing to complete your acceptance criteria okay so we got that covered too right and what about bug prevention so when we think about tests first we actually start thinking of the test more than the code that we are going to write so we have a mental shift of thinking about how are we going to test this feature before we actually start even building it yeah so it's a, like a mental shift because in most organizations or most of our work that we've seen all these years we see that we develop a lot of things and then we come to a point and then suddenly we get these KPIs and stuff like that say hey where is your test coverage we need to reach 90% or you can't go live and things like that but eventually we go live with a lot of bugs <laughs> so yes when you do this you encourage edge case testing okay and when you encourage edge case testing that also helps prevent bugs in edge cases because you cover your scenarios you also in which helps you to invest more time in your exploratory test yeah so we got all of these covered yeah it's i mean easier said than done so we will see in the next few slides and the demo how we are going to do that and those are not the only points that tdd gives you it gives you ease in debugging let's hear from a developer what ease in debugging Okay, well, um, assuming I develop a feature and I have tests that cover every possible scenario of this feature. So if inadvertently the feature changes, maybe another developer touched it, uh, immediately the test would fail. And if I gave a readable name for each test, I would know exactly what went wrong. Mm, and that will also help you I mean, we'll give you more confidence in refactoring, right? Yes. Because you have that safety net of the test that you've written. So when you touch any code that has this test coverage, even, even when you refactor, you know that if you do something wrong, if there's some issue with your delta, you definitely have that safety net of the test failing. Has anyone here heard about the test pyramid? ThoughtWorks talks a lot about test pyramid. Yes, I saw a show of hands. It's about how you arrange the test. So uh, at the ground, at the base level, is your unit test. Then uh, in the middle level, you get your integration test. And the top of the pyramid is the minimal functional or end to end test, which are required to take from a user. And could you tell us why, why that approach helps you, I mean, there is many, many reasons, but could you tell us one? If you are thinking of uh, automating your functional test, you cannot uh, think of adding all of the scenarios and covering each possible combinations which might, may arise. So those things can be easily covered at unit or integration level rather than uh, doing it at functional level. 
yes yes that but if you start writing it exhaustively what happens it becomes really slow when running it right so in software development and delivery we all know that slow means more money yeah because the cost cost taken for the time to run the test your pipelines become really slow then it eventually means that the time to take a bill from your code commit to where you want to deploy to production or wherever takes more time because you take um, I have been in one of the projects that take more than 36 hours to run their functional test suite and it doesn't stop there and to analyze failures another 9 to 10 hours so that is just to make sure that your test pass but when you come right down below if you have those minimal units being tested which will add up to a lot more it can run even in your developer machine so even at your yes question so what you're saying does that mean that we are a certain things that for a meaningful piece of code you can have thousands and thousands of tests we will get to that point where, I mean, yes, it's a, it's a valid question. 36 hours on a fast machine is a lot of things happen. Okay, let's, let's get to that point as to why it's easier testing further down the chain. Right? <coughs> so this is like the first session that we are actually going to talk about. Uh, about TD which lies mainly on your unit level we will have follow-up sessions that we will touch uh, touch the other layers and we'll uh, see how we can demo that too yeah okay now we get to the point of how can I do test driven development right Has anyone heard of the red green refactor cycle? <coughs> yeah. So, uh, red green refactor cycle means you first write the test. You have zero code. Right? Think we are starting from scratch. And then when you execute it, since there is no code that it runs against, it would fail. Then you write your piece of minimalistic code <coughs> to make it pass and then you refactor it when it gets to a point and this cycle goes in and then after that you come to the next test so on so forth so this is called the red green refactor cycle let's in our demo we will touch base on how it's actually done yeah okay so Riju and Jerry will pass you some uh, notes I mean a piece of paper I would like you to bunch up in fours or fives uh, so that you could write, uh, write down this exercise. It's a very small exercise. What we are going to do here now is that this is the functionality that you have to develop. So you are given strings of different lengths. That means anyone can input different strings. If the number of vowels are more than 30%, number of vowels are more than 30% of the string length, then insert mummy for each <coughs> continuous set of vowels. That means if the user inputs his, then the expected condition would be H mummy S because this vowel is more than 30% and it's continuous meaning it can be just on its own as well. So this becomes H mummy S. Here becomes H mummy R, not H mummy mummy R, because for each continuous set of vowels. So we would like you all to write different test scenarios that you that you can think of uh, that you would would uh, try to when you try to accomplish this uh, functionality. So yes, I'll give you five minutes can bunch up in maybe f a group of four or five just people around you mm. <coughs> 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 
No, so he said, can the user go on giving cat dog? And I said, the sample set is the same because cat is also one of the results. Dog is all the same. Oh, so we've got another two minutes more. If that's okay, or if you want more time. Everyone seems to be okay, so two minutes.
special sound to also be changed per se. Yes, from Yeah, a string with no vowels, I guess. It's confusing my mind. <laughs> I think we can put the description in the remit. Okay, so are we all comfortable with <laughs> Are we all comfortable with the test cases we have at hand? Yeah? Okay, cool. So So yes, there is a whole bunch of test cases that you can come up with. Uh, for example, empty string, get an empty string because there is no vowels. If you just input a string with no vowels at all, you just get it written the same, right? Then if it's just a single vowel, it's still more than 30%. You'll get mummy spaces, and so on, so on, so on. And if you have a continuous set of vowels, more than 30%, and another one after that, then you get this, and then after that, it and mummy again. I mean, this is not an exhaustive list, then you can have uh, special characters, see if the thing blows up, etc, etc. Yeah? So it can go on where we see a logical point of, we call it the scope of the story. Yeah? Okay. So these are the test cases we have. Now, uh, we <coughs> would agree with uh, when we get the requirements about certain things, about how we are going to test this. And then after that, we hand this over to Angeline, <coughs> who's going to start hitting her keyboard and do some magic to see how we're going to start building. So, Angeline, hmm. how are you going to actually start with this? Well, um, first I will pick the simplest scenario to work on, because that's the easiest code to write. 
and I would start by writing the test first for the first scenario of passing in an empty string and expecting that the output is an empty string as well. So that means just that? Yes. And it's only the test, is it? So no code? Yes, the test first and then the code later after the test is completed. Okay, let's see how it's done. Okay. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> That's how it's done. <laughs> okay, so I see that um, you input an empty string and then you assert against the mm. same thing. So this is just to match the uh, first mm. test case. Yes. Will it, will it pass though? Let's see. Ta -da. It no, it failed. Yeah. So we, if we track back to our tests, uh, I mean our slides before, we mentioned about the red green refactoring cycle where we only write the test. So if you actually see why this fail, can you see? It's because there is no code that exists. It's just the test. Yeah. So Angeline, what are you going to write next? Are you going to write the entire solution to match all the test cases? No, I'll just write enough code to make this test pass. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Ta -da. laughs> okay, so and I'll check. Fails. <laughs> so this is also, at this point, you've just written enough code, but not enough to pass the test. Yeah. So uh, earlier I had an error. The error is that the string mummifier class or the file doesn't exist. So even though it's failing, but it's not really failing for the reason that I expect. So to make it fail for the correct reason, I create an empty function to return undefined and now it fails for the correct reason where it passes in an empty string but it gets doesn't get an empty string in return, it gets uh, undefined. So let's see the solution. This is the solution. So right now, it's very, very minimalistic. Like, like one gentleman over there said, you write very minimal blocks of code just to let that test pass. And it's going to be a rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, where we then develop something really big, okay? But not complex. Something understandable that will accomplish uh, to fulfill the functionality, but not uh, very readable. Okay, let's see what Angeline has in store next. So after getting the first test to pass, I will look at the next scenario and I will look at the next simplest scenario which is passing in a string with no vowels. So for the second one, if I pass in str as a string, I expect that the mummifier transform function will not transform it because it does not contain any vowels. Okay. So, I would write uh, another test case with a descriptive name to say uh, what is this test testing and I will pass in string and expect string to be returned with no transformation. <coughs> and at this point, I expect the test to fail. So you could see that Angeline has two tests over there, one which passes and one which fails. So in her incremental step, she's written uh, some tests, uh, one test for the next condition, but she still knows that the first one passes because yes, she's not touching the code, but that's how you.
start incrementally developing. Yes, shall we see what Angeline does next? So to make both the first and the second test pass, I would make some modification to the code just to satisfy the two scenario. So okay. these are very baby steps, which we will, I mean, we'll show you the end result, but these are very baby steps that you take uh, to really uh, get to that end goal. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the reason we do these baby steps, even though uh, we are very certain that this is not the solution, is because we want to incrementally build the product. <coughs> So let's, yeah. Okay, so now both are passing. So now her code really caters to both of these tests. So, yes. Is it just for the demonstration that you're creating a bunch of branches, or in reality, would you also create a bunch of branches? No. <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, your, your first statement was the answer. So, just for the demo. Yes. So that it's, yeah. if not, if Angeline keeps on typing, then people will, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. ask it. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So uh, in reality, we remain on the same branch and type it out ourselves. Yeah. Just checking. Thank you. <laughs> How much work is this? In fact, we can have another session for Trump here. Okay. Okay. So we'll we'll just slide through to back to the slide to see mm -hmm. what the next case is. So we we address. Still, we've not addressed any of the tests with the vowel functions. So I think, Angeline, now you're going to head next to the vowels? Yes. So next, uh, just to quicken the pace of this demo, uh, let's just jump to the next two scenarios, which is a single vowel and a vowel uh, that are more than 30% of the string. Okay, so assume we went through the same red green refactor steps. I would first add a test to pass in A, and then I'll expect mummy. And I would modify the code over here to make sure that the code here passes this. So okay. actually, right now we've just been doing red and green only. We mm. we've still not seen any refactoring in place. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are we going to do next? Then? Okay. So we so see we have a class a function that does a transformation mm. of a given input, but we have some things that are hard coded and stuff like that. Okay. So, Karim, I believe you are referring to line 4 yeah. over here and over here. So, if we follow clean code principles, we should give values such as A, I, O, U a meaningful name so that other developers who are reading this code can easily understand what we have done here. Not only developers. <laughs> <laughs> QAs as well. <laughs> Okay, so I did a refactoring where I extracted out A E I O U into a constant variable and I call it vowels so that someone else who's reading knows that okay, so A E I O U stands for vowels. And I've also extracted the string mummy and put it in a constant variable called replacement. So someone else reading this might. No. Okay, so this is a replacement word. So, we if we refer back to the slides where we said that Angie is very confident of refactoring, 
because she has sufficient tests in place. So she knows that if she has a delta here and she does any <coughs> refactoring there, her tests are the safety net to catch that. So okay. yes, there you go. So that yes. That's a quick question. Two years back, I watched the ankle box video for the team. Hmm. And remember, one goal is you only write production code to fix some failing test. Right? Hmm. I mean, hmm. I can't remember the details, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Hmm. So just know there's no the test is okay to me. Hmm. The production code looks okay, but uh, hmm. they're still reflecting it. Hmm. That doesn't really fit the team in the present world. So hmm. just to add to your point, uh, I mean, to clarify uh, your question. So you're saying that you have production code that does not have enough tests? We only write a reflect production code to fix a failing test. Mm. Otherwise, we don't really touch on them. Yeah, so... Uh, that's my understanding why the goals for key. So that's if... Okay, so this is we are starting, we'll say, you're starting a feature from scratch. Mm. Then you don't have any production code at all, right? Mm. So you the yeah, yeah. other side, the right yeah. side is So if you start with something that you already have that's working, that's fine, that's not failing, uh, pumping in code is actually extra work. Yes. So like you said, when you when you touch or when you refactor something, you write test for that. So that if you uh, actually look at this step first, it's like you're starting the process from the beginning, that's why you write that test. Yes. Can I clarify on that? So are we saying that we don't refactor the code that is in production? I mean, so on my misunderstanding. No, no, we 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 would, but what I'm trying to say is, if you have, for example, if you have legacy code, right? Now, would you start writing tests from zero till hundred to finish to accomplish all that legacy code which is already working, but if you are going to refactor that legacy code for some new new work for new enhancement, then like uh, the gentleman over there who said, then you write tests for that, which gives you a safety net. So the other scenario might be that we are in this great world where there are, is some piece of code that exists that has been developed as TTD, mm -hmm. given that it's already now in production, do we try to refactor the code without the tests failing? Like, is there a need to refactor that code for making it better or whatever, right? With all the goodwill in the heart, when we are trying to add some new feature, we figure out that, oh, this can be done better, right? But this, for this piece, there is a set of tests that exists because it was created in TBT. So in that case, should we refactor or not? Because there are yes, no failures. Yes, you, 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 could, you could refactor. So what so we are saying is that there has to be a test harness existing for that, mm -hmm. not harness I should say, but the test bed existing for that, mm -hmm. before you go ahead and try to refactor something. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, actually, to anchor Bob's point, only write no production code expect to pass a free test. Write only enough production code to pass a test. Mm -hmm. I think uh, refactoring is a little bit different from the whole this TDP cycle. Sometimes we just reflect, for example, extract into a, a, a fixed a constant or mm -hmm. you know, anything mm -hmm. which doesn't really change anything to mm -hmm. the I mean, interface mm -hmm. test case. Yeah. yeah. I think it, sorry, I should yeah. be. I mean, the code is in production, there has to be some valid reason for refactoring. It's not for the sake of refactoring. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yes. To my point is uh, everything should deliver some value. Of course, uh, making it's cleaner to be understand by mm -hmm. any technical users. Yeah. But the point is, uh, if you really follow the TV and stuff, mm -hmm. I think you know, we only fix the pro I mean, when I see product code, it doesn't necessarily to be in production, which is distinguished from the test code. Mm -hmm. Product code actually, we, you know, we only mm -hmm. task the product code to fix uh, a red one, which mm -hmm. means we, we do that one. Mm -hmm. yeah, but when we do the refactory, mm -hmm. you know, potentially we break something and bring back. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I think our demo is more uh, during the development process. Yeah. Uh, in real life projects, uh, normally if a code is working, we will 
will not touch it unless we need to add something new and it is in that place. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Just, yeah. Is this just that you're using or would you use just in a you know, real world environment? I mean, there are different choices you could make. Any, any thoughts on why you're using just in uh, this project? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, like uh, for Java, for, uh, for JavaScript projects, yes, I would definitely use Jess, and uh, even in React projects, which uh, I will also use Jess because it comes together with the framework. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? So, okay. So. Uh, I understand for the demo purposes we are taking real real steps, right? And when probably developers start to take this approach, yes. they will start with baby steps. Over a period of time, the babies grow bigger and they become more confident. Are there any guidelines as to how big a step should be? Because if it gets bigger, then there is really like the this thing loses its value. So yes, I mean that's an entirely different topic. You could uh, there are a couple of books that we will recommend at the end of this thing, but uh, I don't want to go too much into detail because then we will go in a different direction. But yes, we will recommend a few books that you could pick up and read about how to maintain clean code, how uh, you could do refactoring better, etc. So my question was more about like. Because these are very small steps, yes. Right? If I'm a developer and if I look at it and I'm like, it's like it's too small, and I'm trying to have to like you know switch between the two way too often, mm -hmm. right? So, are there any guidelines for me to say that even if I'm like a pro developer, I shouldn't be doing a lot of coding, a lot of just writing tests, mm. rather than like you know just testing and coding, testing and coding. <coughs> That's the kind of like, you know, balance that I was trying to find. Okay, so we, um, we actually wanted to touch base on a point called Yagni, but uh, Angeline, do you want to state a little bit more mm. on okay. a real life example? Okay, so um, normally uh, beginner developers who first joined ThoughtWorks and have to do TDD for all their projects. Uh, the feeling is the same, means I have the same feeling as what you mentioned, like I can do this much faster than that. I'm wasting time. Okay. Uh, however, uh, after some time, a couple of months of doing this, I start to see the value in that, uh, is that uh, it, taking the baby steps will make me uh, build the product incrementally and it will not have a uh, code that's redundant in the solution. Means every piece of code is related to a test that I had written first. And if I spend time to write the test, it means the customer wants this requirement. So it will be impossible for me to write a transform function that have some extra code uh, that doesn't have a test. So after I realized that, and that uh, it gave me the safety in refactoring. Uh, I accepted that, that uh, I follow it. Yes. Uh, yeah. I've, I've also seen people use single responsibility rule. So every piece of code or every function should have just one single responsibility. So this rule doesn't allow anybody to write wrong functions. Mm. And there are many rules like this mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in the book that I think you would recommend. Yeah. <coughs> So, uh, yes, shall we move to the next one? Oh, sorry, is there any other questions on, since we are on that topic? Yes? Yeah. 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 They are not really supportive of this because uh, <laughs> when you're doing the agile environment, right, you want the thing to be great. Come out of the product fast. Everything has to be fast. So they will tell you they don't have time to write it. So I'm trying to make the management get their bias. Very, very fair point. I mean, I've heard that a lot of times. Like, I'm not mm. <laughs> so yeah. That's why so many people are smiling here. Yeah. <laughs>
So the thing is, a, a lot of th people say that agile, you need to deliver really, really fast, right? But agile doesn't happen overnight uh, to get. So the thing is, you might be able to really, we'll say you do agile and you have iterations and then you develop and deliver something in your first uh, sprint or iteration or what you prefer to call it. But over time, when you don't actually invest on enough on test, you'll have really big code with very minimal test. And then after you get to maybe iteration five, six, you're like, you know, scratching your head. You can't refactor, you can't do anything. Then starts your dip. So it's not, yes, for your first few iterations, you will be able to zoom and you know deliver really fast but when you start to dip then the management brings up saying hey where's your test coverage why didn't you think about it mm -hmm. so <laughs> exactly so what you need to, I mean what really the management mm -hmm. needs to understand that if you really develop in TDD where TDD is just one practice but there are many things that needs to needs to bundle up and go like you have to have proper CI, you have to do uh, uh, proper reviews, you have to do proper ceremonies. So when you have those in place, your first few, I mean your velocity at the beginning might be slow because you don't have the confidence to refactor, uh, you're not sure how much functionality is to add because it might break something else, but over time, it's going to get you to a very stable state where you're going to give your management or your customers steady deliverables almost every iteration. So that buy-in, it's not easy to get, but uh, once you get into that phase, then they'll start to understand the ROI. Hmm. Um, I have a comment. Yeah, I think uh, if a manager told me that, uh, my reply would be, would you want to pay the cost now, the uh, upfront cost of developers spending time to write tests, or do you want to pay the cost later when the code goes to production and there's a lot of bugs and the customers are unhappy and still it comes back? Yeah. <coughs> Sometimes it happens like you know, uh, it, it's very common practice. Uh, uh, people develop the code and then it get uh, at the you know the job like okay you cannot go to production because your code is eighty percent uh, not below the eighty percent. So what the developer generally have the hacks to like you, know, you just call them. <laughs> <laughs> it will at least cover the coverage. And uh, which is not actually the test coverage. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. good, good. And uh, what we are talking about is the scenario coverage, right? You know? So, how exactly to measure the actual coverage? Because uh, we can we can go we cannot go each and every line and check the coverage back whether you know, by, because uh, sonar and all that that will be actually you can pull actually with the coverage tool that even still you can pass the ninety percent. I, I mean, I would really state that as a, a problem in between people and software. Like, it's not really a software problem. It's not really a people problem. Somewhere in between, because <laughs> this code coverage, I mean, stating that you have to be this, ultimately transforms somewhere into KPIs and all that <laughs> stuff. Right? Right. Is there any way to actually handle? So uh, yes, so your scenarios? your team needs to be aligned with this. Your team, your managers, everyone needs to be aligned to really understand what by doing it gives you. Some people would say eighty percent, but we we are not really forcing on the mark. We need to make sure that we are confident to give you confident for the developers for the QAs for the team to deliver. So uh, I really don't know to say whether is 80% correct, is 85% correct, or is 50% correct. So it's 
So that's a, a very mm. broad discussion that you, yeah. your team, your managers need to agree on how you want to work. <coughs> And the whole thing, if we keep on writing such kind of a scenario, you'd expect, okay? So again, the scenario is something like, you know, uh, because you just have the 10 scenario, 10 to 15 scenario. Mm -hmm. I almost have the dotted down the, uh, like more than 13, 15, uh, again, which is not in your scenario. Mm -hmm. So it's good of the subject to write, you know, I'm just writing the scenario, what I can think of mm -hmm. it. And uh, what will be the requirement, uh, mm -hmm. in how we can justify with the requirement mm. and the scenario, mm. the number of scenario we mm. supposed to write and mm. actual actually make the code as the actual trading mm. code. Mm. So um. we we usually practice something called uh, yeah. yeah we do pair also, but when we actually pick up uh, some uh, work to be done or in some development, we have something called a kickoff, where we have like a feedback session about what we want to achieve like can you maybe show the slide sure so actually yes even i can write like loads and loads more but what we need to get is the correct sample set for an edge case uh, what the happy path would be and so on and so forth we agree on that so if you get proper sample sets about what you want to test and you make your code adhere to all I mean if it's one if you pick up one piece in that sample it should adhere to all the, the that entire samples so it doesn't mean that you write maybe 30 scenarios and then you you know you crack your keyboard and write a lot of code and test that doesn't really make sense to what you said so yes you are right so we need to pick up proper sample sets and agree on what we want as the acceptance criteria. So what what is the I means what is there to pick up such it, it becomes a subject to write, you know? Yes. I may feel like you know this is this is a shit code and this this might be the valid scenario, something like that. So there mm. should be some standard process and the standard agreement uh, before the actually start of my day to day itself. Mm. Isn't it uh, means so I'm not sure actually I'm yeah, I mean, yes. So uh, the question here is, what am I testing? Yeah. Right. What yeah. am I testing? Yeah. Now, I will decide based on the rules that were in the problem statement, like thirty percent. And uh, Angeline, can you go? go and back to the yeah. continuous. Yes. No. Yeah. Right. Continuous thirty percent. These are some of the rules that are available in the problem, right? And based on this, I will have test scenarios, the test data basically, mm. and I will see which are overlapping. So let's say if you scroll, uh, scroll to the next slide. So if you see BLA, right? That's a test data, right? You will not test GLA, for example. Yeah. That's a duplicate test. Yes. So based on this, you will be able to filter out tests. Mm. Okay. What yeah. exactly am I testing? So even beyond this, let's say uh, there's an integration test, right? So integration test. What exactly it is testing? Is it overlapping uh, with a unit test? Can that be covered in the unit test? Which function and which piece of thing is being tested? So that will help uh, define uh, the correct scenarios. Mm -hmm. Usually that's what we, we also So yeah, like what did you say? It's like BLA and GLA will fall into the same sample set. And you pick up one and then go ahead. So we need to agree on what exactly needs to be, like what you said, what exactly needs to be tested. Usually when people pair, right, that is the type of discussion that happens with people. Yes. So uh, I just want to share, like, you know, I have seen some places wherein uh, actually if anything requirement gets changed, basically, we first uh, dig down the test case report and then we identify what was the requirement, basically. Is it something wrong? Yeah, so tests are documentation. Yeah. Right, yeah. We actually do this. When when customers ask us, hey, where's the documentation? We point them to the tests. Because we do TDD in all the projects. So tests become the documentation actually. And they are live documentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't go stable. So that's great value actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh we and Okay. Uh, so we were here.
where we refactored the code, extracting out the vowels and the replacement to make it more readable. And the tests are still passing. Okay, so the tests act as a safety net to ensure that any refactoring we do to change the structure to make it more readable does not break the core functionality of this transform function. Okay. So um, now we see uh, we've written a lot of tests and yes, to cover a lot of scenarios, we might go ahead and write more tests. Actually, do you think this is actually very, uh, very clicky? You mean the code? I've just refactored it, so yes. The tests. Hmm. Okay. So, for the test-wise, I find that the test names are quite readable. Uh, however, like for example, on line 5, 6, 10, 11, I see some duplication there. For example, on line 5, I first initialize a new instance of string mummifier. And then I call the transform method, and this happens in every test. So uh, I don't think duplication is clean. So let's see how we we uh, we could refactor our tests as well. Okay. So assuming. We went on to do more tests for other scenarios. Okay. Okay. And to address Karim's question, you can remove duplication by extracting the common lines into its own function and then calling that function. So uh, in actual fact, what you're doing is you're taking all the repeated code and putting it in one place. Uh, and then you just call it at all the tests. Just to add on to here, so add on to what uh, Angeline said. So when you when you have a lot of tests to actually verify uh, functionality, actually this is a very simple scenario just to get the basics all sorted. But when you write, usually <coughs> your test can become a little bit complex. But when you refactor that also and keep like. We'll say a QA comes to talk to you and say, hey, uh, what's with the story? How, what, what kind of test do you have in place? When you have it in a very, can you scroll up? Uh, when you have it in a very read, no, scroll. Down, okay. Uh, when you have it in a very readable format, it's very easy to under, uh, identify what your specs are or what kind of uh, conditions that you test. So then, the QA has more time to invest on exploratory testing. Like for example, we don't in this we don't cover like special characters. What if we input a special character? What if we try to uh, do something very unusual? What will the system give? So he can then think of you know really trying to think out of the box and break the system, which will help us to what we discussed before about preventing bugs. So you have your acceptance criteria matched here, and then you give the QA more time to invest on uh, exploratory testing. But we'll say you don't have this. Now what the, the QA has to do is, he has to go and really verify does this happen. If it's, just think of it as a very complex situation. Then it becomes very cumbersome. He has to go write test cases, blah, blah, blah check all of this but when he sees this when he sees the test passes uh, then obviously yes he has some uh, confidence but obviously the developer also has to be a little bit helpful not like passing uh, exit zero condition at the end of the test <laughs> <laughs> yeah barring that then you have that confidence Karim are you speaking from experience or <laughs> So, uh, oh, when you have the test cases, right, okay, and you refactor the test cases, yes, how do you know that you haven't messed something up in your test cases? Okay, so uh, when we do refactoring, mm -hmm. 
we try and focus it uh, on one side at a time. So earlier I refactored the code, the string mummifier code, and the test act as a harness and a safety for me. But when I refactor the test, I don't touch the code side. So now it's like the other way around. Yeah. So the okay. code is helping me verify the test now. Actually then, yeah, like Angelique said, your only delta is just... Yeah. yeah. So at this stage, it's the only responsibility of the developer to write all these basic test cases. Is yes. that what you're saying? Yes. Right. And when you write all these test cases, uh, do you also have an agreement with your stakeholders? Uh, do you share with them that this is the basic criteria that will be uh, starting the development with? Yes, uh, sometimes uh, as we write the test cases and we think about scenarios that the customer did not tell us, we have to go and clarify before we can complete this feature. Okay. okay. So, yes, we can go so on so forth. Uh, I think, Angeline, we can show what like the end state would end be state. of... Okay. No, no, not that much. <laughs> so, yeah, you can see that we've uh, covered all the scenarios. We've covered the scenarios where we have uh, consonants and vowels together, and we have the test all the identified. Mm. Don't worry, you don't need to take photos. We'll share the code repo so mm. you can play around with it can try it out yourselves and yes that's the demo any questions on the demo because I understand this is BB step to demonstrate you let's say we change the contest let's say this is a job interview you are applying my job I offer you this question I ask you to write a code where you still follow the exactly same one Mm. Okay. So my answer. Uh, yeah. So uh, my response to that question would be depends on which company you're applying for. <laughs> Obviously, if a company that you're applying for does not care about this, then yeah. Jump in. But if it's a company that it's. Yeah, then definitely you should write the test. Otherwise, uh, it won't, will be fail the interview. But <laughs> do you still start with empty string all this stuff and then until maybe 20 minutes after that you really get into the points? Um, okay. Okay, so um, if time is a constraint in the interview, then I might tell the interviewer that we have a few assumptions. The assumptions is I'll get to the meat of it and not cover the error scenarios yet. Yeah, so in that way, like for example, I will start with something like this and this. Yeah. Will she get hired? <laughs> <laughs> After a few test cases, obviously, all different code coverage metrics could be 100%, mm. given these different conditions, right? Mm. There's a lot of emails, you don't prove it. Mm. I mean, that's not a big problem. Mm. Even a lot of emails, you still get 100%. Mm. The question to me is, uh, mm. how do you, know, let's say, measure your test case? Obviously, we can't test every single combination. Mm. Until a balance, you feel, yeah, I think it's enough. Mm. Yeah, you, you feel enough, mm. or with your prayer program colleagues, you, you guys feel, yeah, enough. Mm. But is there any, let's say, I don't know, at ThoughtWorks or any project, do you have any other name? Let's say, same gentleman's question. How to measure this? When do you say, yeah, I think I got enough test cases? I mean, mm. obviously, we, this is not a feature. 
mm. probably some functions are not exposed to end user. Mm. Nobody knows it. Mm. Only you as a developer, you know you are creating some public method, mm. right? And only you, you know what mm. this method is going mm. to serve, and then you know the test case. But yeah. when do you say, yeah, enough test case? When, uh, well, uh, normally when I'm sent to a project, that project, uh, if it's an existing one, it will have a coverage uh, threshold. Yeah. So if you don't reach a threshold, you cannot push the feature. And of course, the more critical the software, the higher the threshold. Like, uh, for example, if you're working for a bank, definitely you want a very high coverage. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> no comments on that. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. You mean for legacy code? Yeah, so for legacy code, um, if we wish to refactor and touch it, uh, the only way is you have to read through the whole mess and write the test uh, to make sure that anything you touch did not break uh, whatever features that uh, the, the code is supposed to do. Otherwise, nobody wants to have to do it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, definitely branch to another branch and refactor on the other branch. Yeah, so it doesn't affect the current thing. Uh, yeah, so for legacy code, uh, you can't do TDD because the code is already there. So you have to do uh, the test after since the code is already there. But for any new features that go in, uh, they can do TDD. Mm. Nothing to stop the other stuff to you. You can only do the same code and break everything. We've got all sorts of solid tests. Okay. That's quite recent. Nobody wants to talk about this. Yes. I think everybody knows you can get, say, a little bit of writing JavaScript and hang it out fast. Now, with your. Testing. Uh, you, you talk about your new hires spend two months doing their something. Do you get really good at it? Are you going to bang this thing out in half an hour or 20 minutes? Or does it still take you half a day? Or can you get an idea um, how long does it actually take to create okay. in the real world? Well, Is truthfully, or just, yeah. know, truthfully uh, the other day I was with friends and we were doing a code challenge together. And instinctively, I, I created a test. And then they were like, wow, well, you're writing the test. It's slow. But in the end, it, I finished before them. Mm -hmm. So after that, I was convinced that yeah, this is the way to go. Yeah. So I, I guess after some time, uh, we can no longer write code without the test. It becomes like second nature. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. OK, uh, let's move. So, Yes, uh, you could download the example here. Anyone wants to take pictures? Okay. We'll also share the link to the repo on uh, the meetup. So if in case you uh, miss it out, you can still have a look. Okay. So this is, as I said before, it's a part of uh, vodka. As vodka is uh, not the one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's good, but this is much better. So we do uh, a discussion every now and then, and it's very oriented to QAs, but everyone is uh, open to join. So. And mm. So we have a meetup page. We regularly post uh, different meetups. We talk about security, sometimes uh, infrastructure, mm. how to test it, 
and also general QA stuff. So mm. if you're happy, you could join. So it's just at www.meetup.com and you search for this uh, group name. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I can take a photo. Okay. Okay. So yes, some of the books that mm -hmm. might answer your question. Uh, you could look at uh, some of the books that Martin has written. <coughs> Uh, also, there is also, uh, I think it's Ken Beck who wrote uh, Test Driven Development. So, yeah, something interesting. Also, you could read some things like uh, Team Code and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you. There's more pizza.